Hello YouTube, I am Andrew Does Hair. You can find my work on Instagram at Andrew Does Hair. And if you were to do so, you would see that my work is hair. But very often my work is actually photos and videos of hair, which is why I tend to nerd out on camera stuff. So anytime I'm tempted, compelled, anytime I get the feeling that, oh, I wanna do a video about this camera something or other. The bottom line, the main reason that I ever do these is that I had a question that I needed an answer to and I couldn't figure it out. And then eventually I figured it out and I kind of do videos to answer past Andrew's questions. When I didn't know if I wanted to buy an EOS R or an EOS RP, after I owned both, I did a video to kind of answer the questions I had beforehand. And so in this video, I wanna compare the Canon RF 70-200 f2.8L to the Canon RF 85 millimeter f1.2L because a few weeks ago, I was faced with a really nice to, like problem to have, like which one of those two lenses should I buy? Like first world problems, right? But I had so many questions that spec sheets and scientific tests and, and test charts and things don't answer for you. And so I kind of want to do this video to just answer the questions that I couldn't find answers to online. Very unscientific things, just like, what's it like to own the lens? What does it feel like to use it? That kind of thing. And the way that they compare in more practical real life ways and how, how they've kind of fit into my workflow. So basically I sold all of my lenses. I had like a whole lineup of great EF lenses. I sold my 85, I sold my 100, I sold my 135, all L lenses. I sold my RF 24 to 105. I sold all these lenses and I had just enough money to get one nice RF lens. So I was like, okay, that's it. I'm gonna have one lens. I'm gonna be the one lens bandit. Um, I'm actually shooting this shot pretty wide here because I sold all of my tighter lenses, right? And uh, that's what made this decision so hard. It's like, oh, I can only afford one. And so I, I kind of imagine that there has to be a lot of Canon users who are kind of in my boat right now. Like I, actually in the past month, four out of five of my friends who are Canon users went from DSLR to mirrorless. And so even though they're all saying the same thing I said, like I'll just use my EF lenses, like they adapt perfectly. Yeah, they do. But you start to get real curious about that RF glass and eventually you wake up one day and you go, that's it, I'm selling everything. So for about a week, every day, I would put one of these lenses in my cart at B&H and I would be so confident when I did it. And then I'd get like, oh, but what about, and I would end up not buying it. And then I, the next day I would put the other lens in my cart and I'd end up not buying it. So thankfully I have a friend who happens to own one of these lenses and I borrowed it from him. And then what I did is I bought the other one. And my plan was to use both lenses side by side for a few weeks and see which one felt like my lens, like which one I really wanted. And if I decided to keep the one that I had borrowed, I would just return or sell the one that I bought and buy the one that I borrowed to where if I wanted to keep the one that I bought, obviously just keep the one that I bought. And so I got really, really lucky that I was able to kind of test the two lenses side by side and make my decision so much easier. So the first factor I want to talk about is the price. These lenses cost exactly the same amount of money, which doesn't make the decision easier. I mean, if one of them was a little more expensive than the other, then I could do some mental gymnastics and tell myself, well, it costs two or 300 bucks more, so clearly it's the better option. Or I could do mental gymnastics in the other direction and say, well, I'm really smart for saving the two or 300 bucks and not getting the more expensive one. But the fact that they're priced exactly the same just makes this decision so much harder, but they are stinking expensive. Like I legitimately thought I was gonna buy one of these lenses used in five years. Um, and, I, and I feel so grateful and lucky that I'm able to actually use both of them now. But yeah, so in terms of price, they cost the same. Second factor I wanna talk about is the size and weight. Believe it or not, the 70 to 200 actually is smaller and lighter than the 85 millimeter. What kind of crazy bizarro world is this that a 70 to 200 is smaller than an 85? Now the 70 to 200 is in fact like longer, it's like an inch longer maybe, but it's much narrower, it packs more easily and it weighs less, like less enough that it, it feels more comfortable on the camera and in use. So that's kind of crazy. The 85 is a big fat lens. The, the added weight definitely is noticeable on the camera, just the balance of the camera feels a little more off with the 85. This one feels more comfortable to handle. The 70 to 200 will pack easily in a bag. Like it's kind of like a standard, pretty big lens size. Like to me, it feels like using like a, like a Sigma 50 prime on the adapter. Like it's not that much bigger than what you know a lens to be, but the 85 is so girthy. If you go to pack it in a bag, it like stretches out the more standard size compartments. It barely fits in my hard case. Like I have to kind of like wedge it in there. It's a, it's a big enough lens that it changes the way you have to do some things. This thing, what, what makes the 70 to 200 so remarkable is that it doesn't change how you pack. I mean, if you've, if you've had some decent sized primes, you know, like I would imagine this is 
probably even shorter than like the 135 F2 on an adapter. Uh, so it's, it's considerably like easier to live with as far as the size and weight. The 85 is so thick and stubby, I started to notice fingernail marks in this area here where my hand would hit the lens on the way in there. Now, granted, those marks actually just wipe off, thank goodness, uh, but it is kind of a weird, it's like a tell that, hey, that's a pretty tight fit there. It just kind of is telling to the awkward ergonomics of this lens. It's like like a physical reminder that like, hey, you've got a big old lens on there. It's so big that you're, you're scratching it up every time you try to put your hand in there. One thing I was very curious about when I was watching many reviews on the 70-200 is how heavy the front of the lens actually is when it's extended. So I've, I think the only lens I've owned, I've had the 24-105 f4, uh, which does extend, but it, I don't think it extends so much that you think about the extra weight out there, but this extends so much that I just started wondering, like, is that heavy? Um, a million years ago, I had like an EF, I think it was a 75-300, to 300, like the, the kit lens that you get, the kit zoom. and. Uh, I recall that that thing was so light that when it was extended, I couldn't tell if the front was heavy. So the minute I got this lens, before I put it on a body, I extended it and I went, okay, where's the center there? And it is in fact pretty heavy at the front. Like, um, this is very unscientific, but right about at the back of this ring feels like the center to me, just in front of it. So like, focus, like roughly there. So there is some weight out here. I thought that was, you know, a question that nobody had really answered online. And I was like, I need to know, like when it extends, does the, the weight shift forward? And it totally does. So the lens comes with a tripod collar, but if you're using it on the wide end, it's absolutely completely unnecessary. And I think if you got your camera on sticks, it's not moving anywhere. Even using it fully extended, the tripod collar is not fully necessary. Now, if I had it on like a monopod and I was shooting with it extended, for a long period and I was moving it around a bunch, I would definitely use the tripod collar, but for most intents and purposes, it actually is kind of, just gets in the way, it makes the lens bigger and it's not totally necessary. In fact, uh, right now I'm recording on my EOS R with the battery grip installed. That thing weighs more than this thing. And so if anything, like, probably better to have the tripod collar on the body. I, I wanna say like the inclusion of the tripod collar is almost misleading as far as how big this lens is. A lot of times you see it mounted on the body and you don't realize how small like an RP actually is. So you look at this mounted on a body and you go, it's not that small. But then you remember the RP is freaking tiny. And uh, I think by putting the tripod collar on this, they make you think it's a bigger lens than it actually is. But it is repeatedly like blown me away at how small it is. Like every time I go to use it, I'm like, oh my gosh. And you know, you might be thinking, oh, it's only small at 70 millimeters, but once you get it to 200, it's not small anymore. Yeah, that's true. But realistically, practically, when you're walking around shooting, I, I tend to, Walk, carry it around like this, not, not to make it smaller, but because if I want to frame up a shot real quick, it's really hard to frame something up at 200 millimeters. You kind of go, oh wait, where'd the subject go? But if you start at 70, you find your subject and then, you know, crank the, the ring there. So it just kind of feels more natural to start at 70 millimeters anytime you're going to frame something up anyways. So the lens for the most part lives at this size. And the only time it's ever this size is as I'm taking a shot. Third point here is the ergonomics. The 85 millimeter has a really big focus ring and has a really big control ring. And the focus ring turns just beautifully. It's like a dream. So moving that thing around, it feels almost like just pushing your thumb along a track pad. Like you could just use one finger and it just glides. But the control ring on the other hand is much stiffer and it's kind of hard to move it accurately with one finger. Like you want to get a good firm grip on it to make sure you're going to get three clicks or two clicks or whatever you know you want to get out of it. To where with the, the zoom ring, you can just kind of bump it, you know, and it, it's more feely and, and touchy and intuitive-y. I want to say, regarding these control rings, Canon really messed up their implementation of this mostly great idea. See, on all their RF lenses, they put the control ring at the front of the lens, and most of the RF lenses are relatively short, but the longest one that they've made now, the 70-200, they were like, oh, let's put that ring on the back. And so if you're shooting with a relatively short lens, you're more inclined to hold the camera, you know, from the camera and then maybe your second hand on the camera or on the back of the lens. You're not going to carry around like a short little prime holding the front of the prime. It just feels weird. Nobody does that. But as soon as you put a big long lens like the 70-200 on there, you're more inclined to naturally want to hold the camera further out to the front. And so in that case, they go, wait, 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 hang on. And this one, put the ring all the way in the back. On the 85, the ring is so big and, and it's 
kind of hard to turn, and so it feels like palming a basketball to try to get a good grip on it to move it exactly where you want it. I have to, it, it always gives me a slight hiccup in my workflow when I have to touch that ring because I have to remember, wait, on this lens, it's on the front. And uh, oh yeah, and it's really big. Like, I'll, cause I'll go to bump it with my thumb and I feel like I can't get the exact control that I want. So then I have to go and reach around it to, to get a, a confident control over the ring. Now with the uh, 7200, I want to hold the lens further to the front because it's longer. And then when I have to move the control ring, I get a good long stretch on my hand to grab that control ring, which turns a little more easily. It's a little bit smaller. And I feel like Canon should have put that control ring on the back of every lens that they make. And if they were gonna deviate, they should say, hey, people are, this is a longer lens. People are gonna have their hand out here more. Let's put it on the front of this lens. So they got that like all backward. And especially like the, the EF adapter with the control ring on it, that's right next to the body. And so you get so used to using any EF lens and having your control ring near the body. And then you switch to an RF lens and you're like, wait, where, it is on, where is it on this RF lens? Oh, it's in the front. And so it's just like made it a little bit harder to become familiar with the system as a whole. Like I feel like they could have made people adapt to it so much more easily if they just put that ring in the same damn spot on every freaking lens. Like put it in the back of every lens and if you're going to move it, put it on the front of a long lens. Like seems like common sense, right? Autofocus, am I on four? I lost count. So the 85 having a 1.2 aperture lets in more light and it does noticeably focus better in low light. Like I absolutely noticed that. The, the uh, 70 to 200 isn't quite as confident in low light. Now I heard that the RF cameras are supposed to overcome low light focusing problems, but I did find a weird one that I haven't really seen anybody mention. If I have the viewfinder in exposure simulation and I'm shooting in a dark scenario or if I'm trying to get like a low key portrait, it will not focus and I have to overexpose the image and then it can focus just fine. But if I turn off exposure simulation and I'm in any kind of very low light, then the lens is focused considerably better in low light. So it's kind of weird like the, the focusing mechanism or programming or something kind of operates after the exposure, but only in the case that you're, it's like it's linked to the viewfinder in a way that it shouldn't be. It's like, even if I can't see in the viewfinder, the camera should be able to see it. But if I turn off exposure simulation, it focuses in low light just fine. Or if I overexpose an image more than I want it to be exposed, then it focuses just fine. So that's kind of weird. Anyways, back to these lenses. So the 85 focuses way better than the EF version did. It's considerably faster. It's not lightning fast, but it's, it focuses much more quickly and more confidently, I'd, I'd say. You do hear sliding, like you hear the elements sliding around in there. You don't really hear like a motor, but you, you just hear sliding. And then when the lens is making little micro adjustments, like as you're moving forward and back a little bit, you can hear it kind of ticking and the elements are so heavy, you can, you can feel them shifting in there. So if you're hand holding the camera and it's focusing, you feel it like kind of like moving, you know, it feels like it's alive. So it's not amazing, but it's not horrible either, but you're, you're very aware of it focusing. It gives you that kind of feedback that it's doing something. You can feel the thing operating. It sounds something like this. Now with the 70 to 200, first of all, it is the fastest focusing lens I've ever used. It's like unbelievably fast, like crazy fast. It makes basically zero sound. I literally have to put my ear up to it to hear it focusing, but from here, I don't hear it focusing. I, I also don't hear the stabilization in this lens. I've had some stabilized lenses in the past where you can kind of hear the stabilization like clunking sometimes, or it sounds like it's like tapping on a piece of meat. Uh, but with this lens, I don't hear the stabilization at all, it, but it sounds as it's focusing something like this. Low light performance. So when you look at the specs on the lenses, you know, the 85 F 1.2 lets in two and a third stops more light than the 2.8. So in theory, okay, better at low light. But the, two point, the uh, 70 to 200 is stabilized and Canon says that their stabilization is good for five stops of light. So on paper, the 70 to 200 is a better low light lens. I mean, assuming that your camera is still and your model is still. But when I read these claims, I, I often wonder like, does Canon have some kind of a 
a camera testing robot in their lab that emulates human movements and they go, oh, this robot moves so much like a human and the robot gets five stops out of the stabilization. So that's what we'll put on the paper. Like maybe in ideal settings in a lab, they were able to get it to get five stops. But that doesn't mean in real life, like an idiot like myself can actually get five stops out of it. I might not be able to hold it that still, I don't know. So I did a very unscientific test in here. I had a model in here who was in a little bit of a hurry. So much like in real life, when you're shooting in real life, you're on a time limit, right? So I didn't have the time to fully scientifically compare the lenses in low light. But what I did is I turned my lights down very low in here. And then I set the camera in a way where I was very optimistic about my abilities. I set the shutter speed to the slowest that I thought in a dream world I could get away with using. And from there, I started speeding up the shutter until I found by chimping and looking at the back screen, an image that was usably exposed and usably sharp. So I wasn't pulling these up on a big monitor and comparing them like on the spot. I wasn't perfectly trying to match the exposures between the two cameras. I was just starting as low as I humanly, like a little bit beyond what I thought I could get away with and then bumping things down a little bit more until I got something usable. So the idea was to just see which camera ultimately in a real life scenario, trying to take a picture of a model real quick, could give me a lower ISO to give me a usably sharp, usably exposed image based on chimping in the, in, the, in the moment. So nothing scientific about it. So I started with the 85 millimeter wide open. I had the shutter speed set to 1 60th, which again, is just hopeful. I think I might be able to do that with an 85. And I had the ISO around 160. So I took a shot and I noticed that it was blurry. There was some camera shake in there. So I sped up the shutter a little bit and I bumped up the ISO a little bit and I got the shot again, found that it was blurry. And I continued to do this until I hit that spot where I went, okay, that one I can use. And then I set down that lens and I grabbed the 70 to 200. I did the same thing. Now on this one, like I was thinking five stops of light, I should be able to hold this thing so slow. So I started at ISO 100 and I think it was like one eighth of a second or something very, very slow like that. Um, I put the focal length right around as close as I quickly could to 85. I think it was at 89, but I had blurry images. So I sped up the shutter and I raised the ISO and I had a blurry image and I kept going until I had something that in the camera in the moment looked usable to me. And I think what I ended up with was 1 20th of a second and ISO 200. <clears throat> so in that quick, very unscientific test, by the time I went, okay, this is good, the 85 was shooting at ISO 250 and the 7200 was at ISO 200. Now in a scientific test where I put them side by side and tried to match the exposures exactly and I was checking everything on a screen for like supreme sharpness, it might have been different results. But in my quick real life, actually like trying to use this lens real quick test, I got a little bit lower ISO out of the 7200. Image quality. So in my low light test, I got both images to where I was happy enough with them, they were acceptable. But when I took those images and put them side by side, I found that the 85 was sharper. I don't know if I could chalk the difference up to maybe there was some microscopic motion blur in the 70 to 200, or maybe the 85 is in fact sharper, I don't know. But then what I did is I, with more kind of standard lighting in here, I took a shot of the model with both lenses using the exact same settings at 2.8. And as you would guess, the 85 millimeter stopped down to 2.8 was considerably sharper than the 70 to 200 wide open. But that's to be expected because you know a stop down lens will be sharper than a wide open lens. I didn't have a ton of time with this model, so I took the next moment to just get some shots kind of wide open with the 85 to get a feel for what it looked like. And of course, wide open, very, very sharp for a super fast prime. I didn't get a chance to stop both the lenses down to like 5.6 and compare them around there because I didn't care. <laughs> now let me, let me elaborate here. The first time I got the 70 to 200 in here to really put it to work and shoot an actual model and like do some work, my plan was, you know, I set up my flashes and the plan was, okay, I'll start out wide open and then I'll start raising up the flash power and tightening up the aperture until I find that magic sweet spot with this lens. And you know, most lenses I find around 3.5 to 5.6, I can get this really just beautiful, intense image. But the first shot that I took with the 70 to 200 at 2.8, I was like, oh, there it is, there's the magic. You don't even have to stop it down. To be honest, I have still not stopped down the 70 to 200, not one time. I've done it with the 85, just you know, kind of see what's happening in the 2.8 to 3.5 area. But with the 70 to 200, like it is, so decently sharp wide open that I just have, and, and the vignetting is not so bad. And it's, it's like, it's just, there's no need to stop it down. And so I'm not like a sharpness snob, like to me, like I think that the overall image 
steel is a little more important than things just being sharp. When I want sharpness is on a wide lens where I'm gonna be punching in later. Like I want, I want sharper, wider lenses and I want dreamier, tighter lenses personally. Uh, but which brings me on to the bokeh, right? Um, the bokeh, the, the, the out of focus areas of the images. So with the 70 to 200, I had seen some, some reviews online that made it look and in some of the test images, I felt like the uh, out of focus areas were a little too contrasty, a little too, um, not sharp looking, but they were, there was contrast in them and they were like kind of jittery and distracting. And I was kind of worried about that with this lens. With the 85, I wasn't worried about it because it's an 85 1.2, like everything is just gonna be blur city. Uh, but when I had borrowed the 50, the RF 51.2, I found that the out of focus areas with that lens were at the same time very contrasty. It maintained a lot of like, like sharp, crisp blacks in certain areas that, that I felt should have maybe been a little softer. But I will report that with the 70 to 200, uh, it looks like a cannon. It is creamy, as they would say. Like the areas just that the areas out of focus are not, you know, they're not blown away. Even at 200 millimeters, they're still, you know, somewhat recognizable, but they're very, very nice looking. So I'm not like an image quality snob type guy. Like to me, I'm, I'm, I care more about the experience of using a lens than what the actual end result looks like, because like, I mean, I, I can get good enough results with my nifty 50, right? So, so in this department, if you were looking to find which lens was sharper, like I think you'll find that almost every review of every lens on YouTube is all about how sharp it is. So I don't have like a, a great answer for you there, except that yes, they're sharp. Yes, they're sharper than you probably need, unless you're like some top tier gnarly professional who should be shooting on a Hasselblad anyway. So that about wraps it up. Two very, very nice lenses that are very, very hard to choose between compared side by side there. If you've heard anything in this video about either of these lenses that you haven't seen in other videos, give me a like. And uh, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below, of course. And P.S. I kept the 70 to 200. <laughs>